Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So beautiful to be with you this evening. Great to see some recognized faces and names and some new names and faces. Thank you, thank you for being here. Just warming up the room, allowing people to come in. And I think that you have a very interesting topic this evening. So just want to say hi to Elsa. Thank you for being there, Elsa. Elsa is my right hand in life, everybody. So uh, thank you, Elsa, for being there. Virginia, Natalia, Alison, Olivier, uh, Esther, good evening, I can see. Beautiful to see you. If anybody wants to turn on their cameras, please do. And in the chat box, let us know where you are connecting from. We've got Bosnia, Sanela, hi, hi. And we've got Azerbaijan, Baku, Spain, hi, Paul. And Virginia, US kicking in there, Moldova. Alison, yes, you're my neighbor in Barcelona. Fantastic. Coco, good evening. Romania, Cornelia, Belgium, Nantucket, Albania, Canada. Fantastic. Catherine, great to see you. Now, everybody, I want to start this. Oh, Margarita, I can see you too now. Yay. <laughs> um, I'm going to say let's open this up a bit with um, chat box. I'm going to open my chat box so we can kind of get this going a bit because. Um, I think it's an interesting topic. You know, we've got the World Economic Forum in the background. We've got this vision of education 4.0. And really it's a question of what does that mean? Does it mean that we're all gonna be out of a job? Question mark. So I want to start this evening actually with something very different if modern technology will allow me to do this. Let me see if I can just do this because, and then afterwards I want to see uh, your reactions to this. So um, as I say, I'm struggling here. Oh, here we go. Let me introduce you to Rachel. Rachel is going to give you the webinar today. Here we go, everybody. Hello, my name is Rachel. I'm an expert on salt machines. I can talk to you about any of these topics. I connect with you in a human-like way by sensing your reactions and responding emotionally. Wouldn't you rather speak to me than a faceless chatbot? Soul Machines uses neural networks to give me a virtual nervous system so I can learn and react in real time. A virtual nervous system is an interconnected model of aspects of the human brain. It combines different neural systems to enable me to behave in a way that's inspired by biology. Welcome to the real world, everybody. So what did you all think to that? Oh, yes, Olivier, I've rejuvenated. <laughs> Not only did I rejuvenate, but I was also uh, able to share my, my emotional networks through a brain network. Real is better, Luminita, thank you for that. Margarita, you prefer the real Rachel? Good, I'm glad about that. Now, let's open this topic. I look better blonde, oh, thank you. <laughs> now let's come back into this uh, very, very fascinating topic. Now, here we are, Education 4.0, what does it mean? And, you know, a lot of this stems from the fourth industrial revolution, which by the way, has been kind of in the air for some time now. I would say over 10 years, we've had this sort of debate, are we moving into a fourth industrial revolution? And I found this very interesting uh, quote from Nicholas Davis. I didn't like what he says in the fifth line though. The fourth industrial revolution represents entirely new ways in which technology becomes embedded with societies and even our human bodies. So, in the background, we have the WEF at the moment in this debate 
over the future. And one of the debates is Education 4.0. Now, there was somebody on LinkedIn the other day that posted something about this, and I found it very interesting because actually a lot of what they say with the Education 4.0 is what I think many of you and us are shifting into. And I think we are intuitively shifting into a new space. Now let's just have a look at what this means. And I took a photo, so my apologies if the photograph is not very good, I'm not very good with modern technology, shifting things across. On the left side, you have skills that 4.0 will be bringing in. And on the right, we have the educational pedagogy, pedagogies which are coming in. And we're gonna come back to those on the right side a little bit later. And we're gonna be looking at and connecting that with what a lot of us are doing or intending to do, let's put it that way. Now, let's just come back into the skills. You know, we are living in a globalized world. And we, as language educators, we know the importance uh -huh. of global communication. So yes, global citizenship skills, fantastic. Now, how are we going to embed those? I think that's something for curricula to be incorporating. Innovation creativity skills. We have to enhance creativity. We have to enhance innovation. I think that's something that is also happening a lot on many, many levels. Interpersonal skills, well, after a pandemic of two years where people have not been communicating with each other, I think this is something now that we have to revisit on how do we start to help children, especially traumatized children, reconnect in with being human and connecting again. And we'll talk about that in a minute as well. Now, the one that worries me, and I don't know about all of you, and I'd love to hear what you think in the chat box, is the technology. Because we are at a point where top technology is extremely advanced and it's already here. I was trying to look for, I don't know if any of you can remember, it must have been about seven or eight years ago now. The CEO of General Electric, the ex CEO of General Electric, uh, Jack Welch, there was an article that he did and he gave a list of all the professions that you should not allow your children to study because in 10 years' time they're going to be obsolete. By the way, one of them was a lawyer. And I don't know if any of you know, but I am a UK trained lawyer. So for me, it was interesting that lawyer was top of the list. You know, in 10 years time, we're not gonna have any lawyers anymore. It's gonna be a machine. You're gonna ask the machine, what's the law? And it's gonna regurgitate the answer, the situation, the case. You won't need lawyers anymore. If you've got kids studying law, I would seriously think, consider that they start looking at a different career path. Now, it's very interesting that technology, and I think at the moment we've got this really um, lively debate on all social media about this chat, uh, new chat, is it, what, what's it called everybody? Chat, help me, <laughs> chat GDP or chat PGD or chat something, which is literally, automated communication. Yes, it's a chat box, but it has a special name. Yes, thank you, Coco, chat GPD. I've got uh, GPD and uh, all this uh, acronyms on my brain. Yes, chat GP. GPT, thank you, <laughs> not GPD. Are we in danger of extinction as trainers, educators, coaches? That's a big question for all of us. Now, let's go into this a little bit longer, a little bit further and uh, longer. So on the left, we have this um, innovative delivery of education. 
And on the right, we have those skills that are coming in. Now, one part of the WEF website actually talks about the skills accelerators and the fact that we do need a lot of employees to be reskilled. Um, COVID-19 has changed a lot, the panorama of work, et cetera. Um, by the way, somebody has a wild mic out there. Uh, we've just had some just going by. I can't see who it is. Yes, there we go. Forza. I'm going to mute you. My, my apologies. We just muted you there. So, you know, I did a presentation in 2018, and this was one of the slides that I used. And it was actually a slide about the future. And I actually said, Japan is considering installing robots to deliver English because there was a shortage of English teachers. They actually are doing this. They've implemented this. So already we do have robots delivering English lessons. Also, we had this very interesting warning from Stephen Hawking. Intelligent life might develop into something we wouldn't want to meet. What did he know? And if we think about the technology. Ah, Paul, I'm just reading in the chat box. Education training was one profession that is predicted that robots will not take over. Yes, I agree with you. And I'm going to come to that in a minute. And I'm also give, going to give our perspective on that as the educators that we are. Yes. Now, personally, I think that there is a lot of technology that we can embrace. And it's how we can use it intelligently as a complement to us. Okay, there are robot teachers. Maybe we're going to need them because there aren't enough of us. There are automated online platforms. We've all come online. And honestly, I do think online is here to stay. I first delivered my first courses of neuro language coaching back in 2012, 2013, online. Now, everybody's online. And I remember back in those days, 2013, people say, oh, we don't really like this. We prefer face-to-face. -face. Now you've got a mix. People saying, yes, we like it. Yes, we don't. And we can create hybrid. We can do both nowadays. And, and at least we have the choice. I do think the next step is going to be the holographics. Actually, I'm quite looking forward to that. I'm quite looking forward to punching the air and something appearing, you know? That could be quite fun. And by the way, we do have this virtual technology. Um, in the conference in Sitges, we're going to have uh, Richard Twig is going to come with the headsets. And we're going to be looking at learning through virtual technology. The instant translator, well, there she is, chat GPT is the next step, the brain chips is the next step, Mr. Musk connecting us into those, uh, that uh, link to the computers, who knows? For me, it is about embracing the future and I guess it's the same for all of us, how can we? connect in and embrace the future. And we're going to have a look at the, the reasons that we are human, what distinguishes us, so that we can really take hold of this and demonstrate it more and more. So we're not just rational machines. Um, we are going to have to embrace the technology and run with it. Unfortunately, it is here. Somebody just wrote there, it is here. It is. I don't know if any of you read that uh, book by Dan Brown some years ago. His latest book, it was about AI. I do recommend that you read it because it's quite spooky. And especially when you can think, actually, that is here today. The surveillance, 
etc. It's here. So what's left for us? Well, what is left for us is to really focus back in on our humanness and really create this holistic learning approach. Whether we are teachers, trainers, coaches, consultants, whatever we are, how can all of us embrace the humanness and the, the holism and bring that into the environment? So let's just uh, remind ourselves, what, what is it that makes us human? From the physical perspective, well, I did a little bit of research and these are all the aspects that make us human. By the way, don't you just like this blushing response? That's a human trait, uh, blushing. And also, obviously, everything else that you have here. What about from the intellectual perspective? Well, the brain is the tangible part of the physical body and the mind, the intangible part that we possess. And other things that make us human? Well, we are perhaps, I think, maybe we don't have the proof, but we are, to our knowledge, the only creatures that can imagine the future. We're also aware of our mortality. And also episodic memory, the, the creation of episodic memories. And this beautiful quote by Jonathan Gottschall, where we are storytellers and stories really help us to, as he says, explore and simulate the future, testing out different outcomes without having to take real physical risks and help to impart knowledge in a way that is personal and relatable to another person. So quite a few things that, you know, it's, it's food for thought, what is making us different. Some other things that um, make us different, the biochemical factors. So we're getting a little bit into the nitty gritty here. Uh, apparently we are the only ones that have this FOXP2 gene for the development of normal speech and language. And also this urge to link our minds together. So to communicate, connect with each other is also a trait of our humans. So let's just recap a minute because actually we're not driven by instincts. Well, I'm gonna say most of us are not driven by instincts. We do make conscious decisions, we think about alternative futures, we make deliberate choices, we're not rational calculating machines, we determine what we can become. We're social creatures. Matthew Lieberman, the neuroscientist, that beautiful book, The Social Brain, who spent 20 years of research demonstrating that we are wired to be social, we're wired to connect and we're influenced by our environment. So let's come back into this question of education in the 21st century, because you are the ones creating the education of the 21st century. You're the teachers out there. There are two things that the Education 4.0 WF talk about and that's personalized and self-paced learning and lifelong and student-driven learning. So this is where I'm going to bring in the neuroscience and the coaching. And these are the pillars on which we focus and move forwards. And I think these are the pillars of the education of the future. 
Now, if we look first at the neurodevelopment, actually, it wasn't until the 1990s that we first heard more about neuroeducation. And the Dana Foundation was really the first to bring this concept into being. Um, we had this quote from Alok Mehta, your education is an interdisciplinary field combining neuroscience, psychology, education to create improved teaching methods and curricula. Now, from the other perspective, we have the development of coaching, professional coaching. And we'll, we'll go more into that, but it wasn't until the 1970s that we actually saw life and business coaching starting out in the US, coming into the business world, into the executive world, life coaching. And that wave from the 70s has taken 50 years to cross the world. And now we have coaching everywhere for everything. It, I think it's the default profession for everybody to become a coach. And everybody can become a coach. Now we'll come back to coaching in a minute. 21st century education. Well, I think we can go a little bit wider than what the WF are saying. I think we do want to incorporate and embrace all the learning from the past and embrace all the learning that we have that we can use to enhance the learning process. Whether that's from coaching, neuroscience, heart science, there's a lot of science coming out now about brain heart coherence in the learning environment. And a lot of research on brain waves in China, they're starting to use headsets on children to measure their brain waves and check that they are in the right attentive learning state. And the teacher instantly knows which learners are paying attention and which ones aren't from the headset that they're wearing. We need education that's coming into neuropsychology, emotional intelligence. We need motivational coaching. In many cases, we've got kids who are left out of the systems or not able to connect in. So we need all of these skills. And really the science of empathy and compassion and connecting brain, heart, intuition, all the way in everything that we do as educators. Now, in this perspective, obviously I'm a little bit biased, everybody, because uh, as you all know, we are very much focused on neuro heart education, neuro language coaching, bringing in or, or with the greatest intention to bring in this holistic approach. And, you know, as humans, we do have three aspects that we need to respect. Intelligence, awareness, emotions. From the intelligence perspective, it's about now, finally, as educators, understanding the brain. I will never forget, I think it was 2015, I had a, a gentleman from a university in Germany wanting to do my course. And he was interrogating me a little bit about, well, what's on the course and what do you do on the course? And, and one question was, well, why do you go into the neuroscience? Why go into the brain? My answer to him was, isn't it time that we do? Isn't it time that we start to take learning from the brain perspective? Because it's the brain that is the one that's doing the work. 
And if we can help learners to understand themselves, if we can bring in more metacognition, if we can help learners to reflect, and if we ourselves understand it, that's when we're going to be able to really help them more. So as trainers, educators, teachers, coaches, consultants, whatever we are, I do think now we are coming into an era where we need this information. You know, in 2016, there was, a, um, there was some research done in the US. Let's wind back a bit, everybody. Neuroeducation came out in the 1990s. We're now in 2023. Oh, that was a dramatic drop of my stapler. If you think about it, one of the reasons why many teachers are not going into the neuroscience and are not sharing about the brain with learners is because they are frightened to talk about it. And in 2016, there was a research, a questionnaire of teachers in the US What's the reason that you're not bringing out more knowledge about the brain? And the answer was because we're too frightened to talk about it. We're not neuroscientists. We don't know how to say it in the right words. We don't know how to get the message across about neuroplasticity, about neurogenesis, about how the brain learns and subconscious learning, conscious learning. They really didn't know how to do it. And this is one of the major points that we do need teachers now to be able to express in very simple terms. If you're with children, if you're with teenagers, if you're with adults, how can you express simple functions or learning about the brain? By the way, um, Goldie Horn has a foundation which is called Mind Up. And they beautifully train teachers to talk to kiddies about the brain and to help kiddies to understand what's happening when they go into a fight or flight, what's happening when they go into a panic state, how to manage their brains. And they do a lot of this with puppets. And it's brilliant what they do. So if you are interested, do have a look at Mind Up uh, Foundation headed by, by Goldie, Goldie Horn. Um, Esther, I'm just reading a little bit, catching up on the chats here. Um, instead of using AI for marketing and consumerism, it would be great to enhance and personalize learning. Yes, absolutely. You know, if we had that magic wand of being able to direct funds in the right place in life, I think all of us would agree that these funds need to go into education and helping the generations of the future, and especially uh, also to, to manage themselves, to enhance the learning, personalize the learning. And Paul, yes, um, you're saying edugo.ai has been personalizing language learning using AI for several years. Yep. Um, I guess that's AI doing it. And here we are saying, actually, we're better at doing it. So we are the ones now who have to personalize the learning more. And Olivia, yes, if there's a, a, human, a human behind. Um, I love that, Olivia. AI is now augmented intelligence. Wow, love it. Thank you for that. I'm just going to say a, a quick, uh, I'm going to stop a minute, everybody, because I just want to say a quick special hello to Alona. Alona, beautiful to see you. Um, I know that you're in Ukraine. And we are all sending you the biggest embrace to keep you safe and uh, definitely great to see you. Thank you for being here. Right, now, let's get back. So we do need to respect intelligence and help it is teenagers, adults, really bring out their intelligence. We're all different. 
we need to understand that every brain is unique. And we're gonna keep coming back to that today. Secondly, we need to respect that, you know, one of the major, major points, starting points for everything is awareness. And once we have the awareness, we can then bring the awareness to others. An awareness of how we communicate, awareness of how we are transferring knowledge, really developing sensitivity, perception, depth to what we are listening to, to how we are asking those questions. We need to stop functioning on automatic mode. We need to go in full consciousness mode when we are in a learning situation. And when we do that, then we become the, the mirror, then we become the soundboard, then we become, we become the sensor to help the learner to then develop, learn, advance, progress, reach what they want to reach. And emotions. The more we understand about emotions, the more impact and effect we're going to have on the learner. Just this morning, I was talking to, to one of my group and Gladys is there with me. Good morning, Gladys. Um, you know, one lady was sharing that she started becoming more calm in the learning process. And mirror neurons are phenomenal because the calmer we get, the calmer they get. The calmer they get, the more they feel safe enough to communicate. And we all know that language speaking, language learning, it's a nervous thing. It's a, you know, it's, we, we become embarrassed. All of us have been through this. We become embarrassed. We become tongue-tied. We become, well, stuttering or whatever. We need the calm brain to operate. We also have that sensitivity to, to really understanding what is the emotional block? What is it that we need to help our learner to go beyond? How can we shift the learner into a perfect learning state? Now, forgive me because I have been playing with this and some of you know this. IQ plus EQ plus education, your hard education. And IQ plus EQ plus language Q, your language culture. Just a little uh, play on IQ, EQ, etc. So why coaching? Well, you know, they're talking about personalized learning. They're talking about autonomous learners. Yes, we do want that to happen. But for that to happen, we have to know how to provoke it. Can anybody become a coach? Yes, anybody can. You know, I was, I was uh, actually today I saw there was uh, on Facebook, there was a thread, a very interesting thread about what is coaching? What is language coaching? What is, anybody can be a coach. It is an unregulated profession. You know, the irony of all of this, the sports coach, actually aspires to become a sports teacher. So the sports coach actually goes to university to get the qualifications and the degree to become a sports teacher. Now we have the phenomena that teachers, trainers, educators are now looking to become coaches. So it's totally the opposite way around. Anybody can become a coach. The question is, what is the professional coaching training behind anybody calling themselves a coach? Now, professional life coaches out there, you have the ones which have the training from a recognized body worldwide and the ones that don't. And it's the market choice. It's the 
client's choice to decide who do I want as my coach. And by the way, there are NLP coaches, there are psychologists who are coaches, there are all different types of coaches out there. Can I say that there are also educational coaches? So there are universities offering coaching education and there are MAs with coaching. And it's all valuable, valid, and all accepted. The question for us is, if we are introducing coaching into education, what are we introducing that's different? Is it that we're just personalizing the process? Is it that we're just calling ourselves a coach because we've had a long experience doing it? Or is it because we are actually incorporating structure, skills, competences, guidelines, standards, and ethics from a professional coaching body? And that's when you look at the accreditations or not when people are calling themselves a coach. Now, we are accredited by, by the ICF uh, right from the beginning in 2012, 2013. We were accredited and we have had the accreditation now for over 10 years. And everything that we do is following the guidelines and standards and the ethics of the ICF. And to be a coach is not easy. Let me, just, um, let me just get some smiles going in the background. Some of you are already neuro language coaches. So is it easy to be a coach, a professional coach? I've got some, Virginia, you just turned on your camera as well. And Catherine, <laughs> Catherine's nodding her head as well. Right, now. Honestly, it's not easy. It takes years and years. It takes self mirroring. What am I doing? What am I not doing? And it, it really changes habits, changes behavior, changes communication, and it's not easy. You know, we said a minute ago, the first step is the awareness. And the first step is the awareness of what am I doing as an educator? What impact am I having on the learner? So, there are certain competences laid out by the ICF. By the way, uh, number two is my favorite, embodying a coaching mindset. Very much that growth mindset, solution focus we're moving away from drama problems we're really coming into how can we help what do we need to do where do we need to get you and seeing how we can move our learners our coaches into the space where they want to be and for me i don't know about all of you I often get the question, well, how can you bring coaching into teaching? Because actually in coaching, we're not there to tell people what to do. We're not there to give advice. We're meant to be there soundboarding back. And I totally agree. You know, it is really a little bit of a dichotomy when you bring coaching into education. However, when you bring in the non-directive approach, when you bring in a little bit that Socratic suspense, where you're trying to get the learner to find the answers themselves, to connect in, to see if they could imagine the answer. And if not, then that's when we're stepping in with transfer of knowledge. For me, coaching and education is about this involving the learner. We're not just talking at them. We're not just explaining and giving them information for them to then go away and digest. We're actually talking with them 
and we're interacting all the way through. And I would even suggest that when we are introducing new knowledge, we're introducing a little bit and we want them to try it. And then we introduce a little bit more, we want them to try it. So you've got this instant application and this constant interaction in a very safe environment. That for me is the essence of coaching and education. And it is possible to bring in this coaching approach. And this is what the, the, the Education 4.0 is saying, you know, they want us to bring in this personalized approach, the autonomous learner, encouraging them to self-regulate. By the way, there was some recent research from the neuroscience. I've just thought of it now, otherwise I would have given you the link. Where they are seeing that self-regulated learners not only lead to achievement of goals, but it also has an impact on well-being. Learner well-being is impacted when they self-regulate and they achieve by themselves the goals that they have set. I think that was a 2021 research coming out. Just to share with all of you, you know, I actually was a, I was a school dropout. I left school when I was 16. And it was my brother-in-law when I was 23, 24, who actually uh, gave me a kick and said, Rachel, you should get back to university. Rachel, you should get back to studying. Rachel, you should do something. And he connected me into the University Nacional de Educación a Distancia in Madrid, because I was living in Spain at that point. And I became a student of the Distance University in Madrid. I became an autonomous, self-regulated learner. I did the access to university at the age of 24. And then I went on to do uh, law as a degree. And then I moved back to England and did BA law and Spanish. And I became a very autonomous, self-regulated learner. And that's when I personally thrived as a learner, not at school, by myself, discovering what worked for me. Now, this is something that if we can help learners to discover themselves, empower them, they're going to find what works for them and we're all different. Now, the one thing that we have to do is change the way that we communicate. And this, as all of you have said earlier, is one of the hardest things. Non-directive, asking the right questions, not jumping in finishing off their sentences, not focusing only on what we want in that session, but trying to get them to come in to really set their goals, their actions, what they want to do. And being in that space to provide psychological safety. I had, um, I had a group last week of neural language coaches who started one of my additional courses. I don't know if any of you are here. Um, the course is about the ongoing sessions. And there are a group of about 10 of them. They're, I'm going to say veteran neural language coaches. But I was sensing there was a little bit of nervousness. You know, when you start a new course and you don't know everybody and you kind of, and I was there trying to say, look, guys, I don't expect anything from you. I don't expect you to be perfect. I don't expect you to know everything. And we're here to really go into the nitty gritty and get you a little bit firmer. And there were a couple of times where I heard one, two, three of them say, I've got a question. I don't know if this is a silly question, but I've got a question. And that was the introduction to how they were asking the questions. And at one point I said to them, there are never any silly questions. 
Questions mean that your brain is looking for an answer. And the best thing that you can do is ask that question because if not, your brain is not going to rest until it finds that answer. Now, this is something that we have to let our learners understand. Ask me anything. I'm accessible. And anything you ask is accessible and, let's say, acceptable. That's the way that we need to be communicating with learners, letting them find their way forward. And moving into compassionate conversations, you know, we have to stop trying to convince learners. When learners say, oh, I'm no good at this, and we try to convince them and say, you're fantastic, you're great, I think you're wonderful. No, we have to stop doing that. We have to become compassionate. I'm really sorry that you feel this way. What do we need to do to help you to feel better? That means I'm listening to you. I'm listening to you and what you're saying, and I want to help you shift into a better space. So what do we need to do? That's a compassionate conversation. Not trying to convince them and moving them away from what they feel. Uh, Esther, yes, knowledge is power. And figuring things out and having to think is considered stupid, yes, unfortunately. And hopefully, hopefully, we are all coming back to being educators that allow people to think and also to find their way and also to appreciate that everybody's different. And what may work for you may not work for somebody else. So let's try and find what works for you. And hopefully, hopefully, the more of us, the more we're changing the systems. That's the vision. Now, learner autonomy, ownership. Definitely coaching allows for learner autonomy and ownership. Coaching means that we are taking that step back. We're allowing them the space. We're finding out from them, what are your goals? What are your actions? Then we're creating the roadmap based on that. We're personalizing the process like the Education 4.0 says. We're helping them to learn how to learn. We're giving them the mirror. We're using permission questions to really get them calm, and to get their autonomy going. And as I said before, constant involving, they are setting out the path. And not to forget the research, especially the research from Sheldon and Kassa, when students autonomously self-regulate, they're more likely to achieve their goals and also well-being outcomes. And as many of you know, my favorite, favorite quote is from T. Doyle. The one who does the work is the one who does the learning. And this is where teachers have to stop doing it for them. Absolutely, my favorite quote in the neuroscience space. And psychological safety, we know that mathematics causes that anxiety. I do think language learning is even worse than that. And by the way, just to give you that little quote about Dutch courage, where you know when we've had a glass of wine, we can all speak a language better. Prefrontal cortex, transient hyperfrontality allows the rest of the brain to play. That's why we become more relaxed and the language flows. Now, obviously, you can't tell your learners to have a glass of wine before they come to a session, especially if they're underage. But we can know how to calm them down. It's key that we understand how to get those imagine, you know, those emotional triggers down. Olivia, I have to say you are the master of wordplay. Why not? <laughs> I love it. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, Virginia, your husband speaks Lithuanian after wine. Excellent. <laughs> we'll have to test it. If he's coming to Sitges, we'll have to test him. So psychological safety is key. And here we go with the second two with that education 4.0, the accessible and inclusive learning and problem-based and collaborative learning. Now, accessible and inclusive, well, yes, let's talk about every brain is unique. You know, the other day I had a conversation about neurotypical and neurodiverse. And actually my question was, Albana, good evening. I'm just going to mute you. You're on a wild mic. My question to all of you: Aren't we all neurodiverse? Can we really say that we're neurotypical when we know that every brain is different? Sorry, that was something that the other day was sticking in my brain. I just wanted to throw that out to all of you. So every brain is unique. And physiologically, yes, we share the same functioning. We share the same interconnectedness with brain, heart, gut. We have the vagus nerve connecting all the major organs, connecting brain to the heart, to the gut. And yes, we are looking for this holistic approach. We're looking to get an inclusive approach. And the brain is the key. Unlocking knowledge about the brain is going to be key, even for those who are, I'm going to say, disadvantaged learners, struggling learners. I have so many neuro language coaches working with struggling learners successfully. I think some of you already know that some of our new language coaches have been working with some children in Italy, children who suffer with dyslexia, dyspraxia. They are having the most amazing breakthroughs. Now, one of my, um, well, actually, the research paper that I had to do for my master's in applied neuro, neuroscience, I actually studied ADHD in language learning. And I did a study on whether um, language learning is impacted and what could help people with ADHD with language learning. And one of the strongest results was personalized individual training, teaching, coaching helped these people with ADHD to learn. So again, we come back to Education 4.0. They want us to come into personalized learning, self-autonomous learners. Yes. That's what we're all trying to do. But the more that we understand how the brain functions, the more that we can help learners to understand that, the more they will know how to self-regulate and learn. And understanding that the brain is a connection machine. We scaffold. We associate, we connect. Now, if we as educators know how to provoke connections, that's going to help them to fire and wire and create more neural ne networks with connections. So we have to consciously understand when we are in a language learning space or in any learning space, how can we help them to connect different things is to make those associations. It's a little bit like that, re that research with Janice Aniston and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. They had a group of people looking at this picture with Jennifer Aniston and the Leaning Tower of Pisa. And then later, whenever they looked at Jennifer Aniston or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, 
the same set of neurons were firing. What can we do to help people provoke connections and associations? And in language learning, many of you know that I am an avid, well, avid linguist, fascinated with connections, always asking, how is it in your language? How is it in my language? How do they connect? What's the same? What's different? And that's what we have to do with learners because we have to get them curious. The more that they are firing and wiring and connecting and patterning, the faster they're going to learn. And understanding how the brain likes to learn and really understanding that, as we said, we are dealing with a scaffolding machine. So if they already know a language, maybe they know another language. Maybe they can bring knowledge of that in. And remember that we have the research from 2016. When we learn a new language, our brain is going to the native language areas first. That's how the brain naturally tries to learn a new language. The one thing that we are aiming for as well is to arouse curiosity. If you can arouse curiosity in your learner, then you get dopamine kicking in. If you've got dopamine, you've got more connections per second. So what can you do to get them curious? And how can you get them to relate? How can you get them to connect to the language? How can you make it real and personal? The brain loves real. The brain loves personal. How can you get them to contextualize? And talk about the learning. Talk about the learning process. Talk about the language plateau. Really discuss where are you now with this? So, we are coming into an interesting future. I do think, based on everything we've said today, and a lot of you in the chat box, I can see exactly what, what you're saying as well. Our humanness can never be replaced. I think it was Paul. You said, actually, the WEF have admitted that teaching and training as a profession can never be substituted. And I think this is where we have to really demonstrate more and more the holistic educators that we are. And we have to embrace more and more from coaching, from neuropsychology, from emotional intelligence, understanding how we are wired to be social and connect. And how we can maybe walk hand in hand with technology, but really bring back the joy of learning. By the way, um, this, this um, Voyatsis and McKee, joyful discovery, playful creation, flowing performance. Again, one of my favorites when we're thinking about learning and educating and teaching. Just to share with all of you a little bit this journey, you know, this journey of 10 years has been an interesting journey. I actually want to say thank you for all of you who have been on this journey with me and who are on this journey with me. Some of the early ones, uh, right back from 2013, Margarita, you were one of the early ones uh, right back then. And, you know, it hasn't been a easy journey. You know, at the beginning, when I started this journey, I was very heavily criticized, attacked. Uh, sometimes on social media, people were having a swipe. And as I said earlier, you know, why are you connecting with coaching? Why are you connecting neuroscience? Why is it accredited? And now, honestly, it makes me smile because, you know, they say, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, here we are. And we're moving forward. And now, just over 1,300 neuro language coaches worldwide. And we have 32 teacher trainers ready and poised. Um, we've got some of them here today, Virginia for Chinese. 
Margarita for French. And we're now going to be delivering in 12 different languages. And little by little, we're rolling out through the world, little by little, with the neural heart and the neural language. And here you can see, you know, on the one side, you have the neural heart educational coach, which is for any teacher, any discipline. We're hoping to help a lot. Um, I've got a, a school in Nicaragua ready to do a pilot program with me. And uh, we're going to be having teachers of mathematics, physics, sciences, geography, all types of teachers coming into that. And then on the other side, we have the neuro language coaching, which is specifically for language learning. We connect into how the brain learns a language with that fascination of how can I get my learner to connect faster and more effectively, more efficiently. You know, the, the change of, of self is really the first step. And through the years, for me, this, this change from quiet, sorry, from, from sort of this insecurity, uncertainty into this quiet confidence, um, the empathy to compassion, the learner-centric focused learning, and that self, selflessness, I think that is, that these are the elements that educators possess. And these are what more and more all of us, all of you, are, are very much um, bringing out in the world moment. These were the first uh, teacher trainers back in 2018. Margarita, you're over there on the right side. <laughs> yep. And just a little quote uh, from the book, you know, um, there is that shift into not telling coaches what to do really finding out you know many people say to me how can we get the, the learner to set their own goals we do it in a way where we give them choices that's the secret to be able to give learners choices where they take the ownership and they choose it's almost like the learner is choosing the stepping stones of how to move forward so it becomes a personalized roadmap. And moving away from being directive, we really come into that non-directive space and to focus on being the catalyst, the provocateur par excellence, constantly provoking the connections. Absolutely. Understanding the emotional and social pain, understanding how we need to really bring in explicit and implicit learning, conscious, subconscious, how to really create the safety to get what I call that perfect learning state. Does it exist? I think it does. How to coach around the triggers, the blocks, and really how to bring in the brain-friendly elements. just coming up to finalizing and opening up the questions in a minute. Forgive me for just a couple of minutes to explain that neuro language coaching is an accredited course, 36 hours with the ICF accredited community of the most amazing, brilliant, like-minded minds across the earth. Some of them are here. Um, always doing free webinars, networks. You know, in 2019, pre-pandemic, um, I was traveling across the world and wherever I was traveling, my mission was to deliver as many free talks as I could. And in that year, I think I delivered to about 3,000 trainers and educators. And this year, I'm rekindling that mission. So I will be traveling and wherever I go, I'm going to be delivering free talks. Um, and opening up the space for the, this discussion of how we can really enhance and help each other across the world to, to develop and change into the education that we all aspire to. And I'm not saying that everybody should become a neuro heart or a neuro language educator. 
we're all in this together. It doesn't matter who we are, what we are, we are all moving and shifting this educational space together. Absolutely. By the way, this week we do have quite a few webinars. I didn't realize that, by the way, I'm my own boss and my own scheduler, and I hadn't realized that I put in so many for this week. So I think on Friday and Saturday, we've got some more webinars. If you're interested, the one on Friday, I think, is how to always be a coach in an educational space. And on Saturday, I think it's about the motivation. So if you're interested, yes, come along. Finally, just want to say that last September, we finally, finally got the approval for the NeuroHeart Education Foundation um, from the Ministry of Education in España after an 18 month battle with them to finally get a foundation set up. And this year, definitely, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be uh, getting the accelerator on this and we will be looking to develop um, all over the world, transforming and helping educational institutions that cannot afford to have teacher training and teacher development. So we will be um, trying to deliver teacher training wherever we can, free of charge. Um, we will eventually be looking at also bringing in homeschooling and uh, even other courses. So the education I'm hoping will be delivering um, emotional intelligence courses from other third parties, uh, neuroscience courses from other third parties, positive psychology from other third parties. So, you know, we will be creating a menu of holistic educational courses as we progress in the future. With the mission to really bring in neuro plus heart education and to bring, bridge the gap between the science and the classroom. Uh, to really come into the volunteer programs like we have the volunteer program with the foundation in Italy, helping the Italian children and uh, definitely raising funding for the educational space. So this year do stay in touch and in tune because we will be, we will be developing this more and more. I confess I need another 25 hours in my day to do this, but I will find it. And finally, just to say thank you, thank, thank you, thank you for being here. If you do want some more information, do check in. Um, Neural Language Coaches, you know that we have the, the conference in Sitges at the end of March, which is for Neural Language Coaches. If any of you are not Neural Language Coaches and you want to come along, you're welcome. Uh, just that you know it is for our development over there. Um, and in the summer, we will have the Neuro Heart Education Conference online. And it will be a free online conference to the world. So that will be the difference this year that we're doing two conferences, not just one. And as I said this week on Friday, you have uh, the webinar about always being a coach, no matter what you're doing. And on Saturday morning, motivation, what does it mean? And um, finally, Neural Language Coaches, we will be doing Watch Out because we will be doing a marketing uh, webinar again with James Yu and Sol and Sima. So if any of you are interested to come into a little bit more of that marketing um, with pleasure, do check out on our networks what we're doing.